I had heard through the grapevine that there was this young man who had directed Reservoir Dogs, and uh, I was intrigued by his fascination with me and why. So when I met with him, uh, he, he enlightened me about what I meant to him as a young boy growing up, uh, what <clears throat> Saturday Night Fever meant to him, what Grease meant to him, what um, Blowout meant to him, and uh, what um, Pauline Kael, the, the famous critic of the time, I was her, fortunately her favorite actor, and she had quite a cachet in, in the critics at, at that time. Uh, and he followed critic, critics. And so his favorite critic, uh, his favorite actor was me, and his favorite actor was me, and he f kind of felt this kinship about isolating me as this, this icon that needed uh, to have a very special career and a very unique uh, a talent. So um, he also was a fan of the first TV show I did called Welcome Back, Cotter. And he had collected games like uh, board games of each of my famous shows, you know, Cotter and Grease and Saturday Fever. And he had this fantasy that we would play games together of these shows. And um, I was, so uh, touched by his uh, his uh, infatuation with with my my career, my uh, the, the the projects that were important to him at, at the time, that I um, I went with it, and you know we played board games and we caught up, and he told me about his life, and I told him about my life, and. Um, then he also told me of his disappointment in some of my career choices after the initial one, and I was kind of hurt my feelings at first, but when I contemplated on it, I said, you know, criticism by its nature is not valuable. Nattering is not valuable, but critique with an intention to support someone is valuable. There's a big difference. He's saying, I see what you are and what you can be and what you will be. And so we stayed up till five or six in the morning from about 11. So we had a good six, seven hours together. And right before the evening ended, which was the morning really, he said, you know, I have this project in mind that you, you would be really right for. And he went into depth about it, but it wasn't Pulp Fiction, it was um, Dusk Till Dawn. And then he told me a little bit about this other project called Pulp Fiction, but it was already cast with this uh, other actor, Michael um, Madison. And, uh, and so he told me about both projects, uh, but clearly I had more enthusiasm for the Pulp Fiction project than I did The Dust Till Dawn. But he was tremendously um, puzzled by this. And he, and he, uh, he finally said to me, oh, wait, wait, before you go, um, before you go, um, what, 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 what is it exactly that you are not responding to and to this, to the desk till dawn thing? I said, it, no, it's fine. He said, no, no, no. Well, what don't you like about it? I said, I'm just not into vampires. I said, I, I'm sorry. I just, it ain't my thing, you know? And he went, oh, oh, okay. I said, but the other project I liked. He said, yeah, yeah, but that, I, yeah, but I got that. Uh, he said, okay, well, we'll find something one day together. I said, okay. I remember meeting Quentin when I auditioned for Reservoir Dogs. Uh, and I was supposed to read with uh, Tim Roth and somebody else because I was reading for the guy who does the thing with him on the roof with the dogs, and the story about the dogs in the bathroom. I didn't get that part. Um, and I read with uh, Lawrence and Quentin. I actually had no idea who they were, but I went to my audition. I'm reading with these two guys, and I'm like, and I left the audition going, fuck. Who the fuck was that? I'm, those guys sucked. I'm, I'm never going to get that job. And I didn't. But then I went to Sundance, and I was there for the first screening of Reservoir Dogs, and I saw Quentin, and I went up to him to tell him how much I liked the movie. And, I was like, and he said, how'd you like the guy who got your part? So apparently he remembered who I was. I was like, well, you would have had a better movie with me in it, and I didn't realize you were the director when I was reading with you. He said, don't worry, I'm writing something for you. And I was like, you remember me? You're writing something for me? And he's like, sure, sure, sure. It's kind of a weird story, but I was taking Amanda Plummer, who I knew, um, to um, the Fisher King premiere. 
And, uh, <laughs> and I knew, I, I knew she'd be late. So I, uh, it was her premiere, it was her red carpet. So I, I said to the car to pick me up at my flat and then we'd go around and get her from a place around the corner. And uh, so I took her and she was asleep. So threw her in a dress, threw her in a car and then took her to the premiere and Quentin was there. Tim introduced me to Tarantino there and I liked him in less than a second. And he said he'd like to work with both of us, so I was over the moon. I said, I want to do a film with you, but with Amanda, but she has to have a really, really big gun in her hand. Because <laughs> the idea of Amanda with a gun in her hand is, is really quite scary. And so uh, he, wrote that, he wrote those parts for me and her. I had met Quentin at Sundance. We both had films. He had Reservoir Dogs and I had The Water Dance. And we were sort of the films in competition. And I went to a screening of Dogs, and that night I had the, just the strangest, weirdest dreams. And the next day I ran into Quentin at a screening, and I told him, I said, dude, your film really messed up my mind. And he said, good, that's great. That's exactly what I wanted to. That's fantastic. And uh, then I think we all went to a party. And then I think the next year or two years later, I was walking down Broadway in New York City in the morning. Because I remember that morning light. And I looked across the street, and, and I sort of recognized Quentin has a very specific lope. He doesn't walk. He's sort of he's like an animal. It's like a jungle cat. And uh, there was some, something shiny on his hand, and, and I got closer, and he was wearing a Toxic Avenger ring that was probably as big as his... No, it's just a massive ring. And uh, we started talking. He said, oh, I was just talking about you because I'm staying with a friend. And my other friend has a script that he wants you to do. We were all just falling over each other with, hey, read this script. What do you think? Read this. Can you be in this? Do you want to do that? It was a very fervent summer. I remember sitting at Swingers in Hollywood with him at the, at the um, you know, the bar, bar, <laughs> um, and, uh, and talking to him. Uh, and... You know, he's just a, an encyclopedia of, of information about anything to do with film or television or anything that it was ever shot ever in all of humanity. <laughs> Six months later, I get a call saying, Quentin Tarantino has rewritten this Pulp Fiction with you in mind now. He's off the, the Michael Madsen idea, and he thinks that after spending the night talking to you, that you were this, um, you had this analytical part of your personality that he had not been aware of. And he wants this hitman to have this philosophical, orderly thinking. I said, great, let me read it. I was doing this film in Lexington, Virginia, and I got this plain brown rapper with, um, I guess Danny's company logo, it was like a little gangster with some sunglasses and a hat on, and said, you know, if you, show this to anybody, we'll find you and kill you. And I sat there, I opened it, and I, I was saying, the part for you is Jules. I read it, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just flipped it back over, and I read it again immediately. I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. He wanted me to look at the two robed characters. He said, there are two guys that wear robes. Look at those roles, and we'll, we'll talk about it. And I think ultimately he wanted me to play Lance because Directing that needle scene was probably much more intense than uh, directing the scene that he was in with Harvey Cattell, I think. They called me one day and said they wanted me to come in because they wanted to hear what Jules sounded like. And I was like, all right, sure. So I went in and, you know, we sat there and I read with Lawrence again and somebody else in the room. And then they started to have auditions, I guess, after that. And like I said, I was in New York doing Fresh. Uh, and I get a phone call from my manager saying, and, well, apparently they read some guy who asked to read your part when they were auditioning for something else, and they were so blown away by him, they're thinking about, you know, giving him the part now. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? It's like, nobody told me when I went in to read I was auditioning. They told me the part was mine when they sent me the script. So it was one of those Hollywood lessons that you always have to do the things that you do. Don't take for granted that just because somebody said it's yours, it's going to be yours because they changed their mind. Just 
the wind blows one way and blows another way on another day. So they brought the other guy in. They brought me in. It's Lawrence Quentin and Paul somebody. They're all going, hey, 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 and they get ready to introduce him. He says, oh, you don't have to introduce me to this man. I love your work, Mr. Fishburne. And I was like, for real? He didn't. <laughs> so now I'm like really pissed off. But we get in the room, we start to do the reading, and we're like rocking through it. And the reader, <laughs> I don't know who this guy was they hired as the reader, but he's reading with me, and I'm like going through this thing, and I'm like boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden, dude's not reading anymore. He's like just staring at me like, and I'm like, dude, this is an audition. And he's like, oh, I was just so mesmerized. So he was lost. I'm like, he's going to blow the job for me. But we continue, and um, we end up with the diner scene. We do the diner scene, blah, 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 and it's done. And um, I get on a plane, go back to New York, thoroughly pissed off to finish fresh, and then Lawrence comes back. And when he gets back that day, he tells me, look, don't worry, everything's cool. Role is still yours. But let me tell you, we never knew how this movie ended until you did the last diner scene, until you did that last monologue. And that's what like cemented the job for you like when you did that because the room was like totally silent you could hear a pin drop in the room and he was like now we know what happens at the end of the movie so thanks the truth is you're the weak and i am the tyranny of evil men but i'm trying ringo i'm trying real hard to be the shepherd Everybody wanted the role. Daniel Day-Lewis wanted it. Uh, and he was super, he just won an Academy Award. He was super hot. And the kind of guy they wanted in the part, you know, uh, I think um, there's about a half a dozen really hot guys artistically that wanted the role. And um, Quinton said, you know, I'm going to go back and repair this guy and put him in a role that he deserves to be in. And I'm going to fight for it. And nobody ever did that to, for me, you know. And that's why my memory of his love and depth of admiration is my favorite part of my memories of Pulp Fiction because I, I've never, it's more like what your mother or father would do for you. And I didn't even know if I was going to live up to his expectations, but there's something interesting that happens when someone believes in you that much. You suddenly, your best self comes out, your best abilities, your best your need to make them correct in their decision and their choosing you comes to be. And you give your the best you can give. And that's what I did. I just said, I'm not gonna let this boy down. It's typical kind of Quentin casting as well, is to go for somebody, a, you know, an iconic figure like that and, and just put him in something very, very different. In fact, his career was doing famously. He was doing the Look Who's Talking movies and all that, they were huge. Absolutely massive, those films. And he was, he was doing great. But this took it to somewhere else. I mean, people just hadn't seen him that way. And that was a lot of fun for him, I think. I remember him saying something along the lines of, oh, it's great to finally be acting again, or something like, or something like that, when we were sitting down and rehearsing. He was having such a good time. The script itself weighed about 14 pounds. It was, <laughs> I, I wish I, I have it somewhere at home. It, it, it was 230 pages or something. It was a novel. And before I read it, I said, wow, you got to cut this down, man. It's really long. And he said, no, no, uh, Preston Sturges or some, some great writer, director, you just, you just write everything and then you, it goes like this. You'll never know. It's, and, and he was right. There are pages, like Chris Walken's thing. <laughs> must be three or four pages of solid dialogue. This was your great-grandfather's war watch, and he wore it every day he was in that war. And you look at that and you go, ooh, I wonder how this is going to work. It's clearly touched by genius, but this is four pages of a guy talking, and that is, it's ballsy to write like that. He had me up in his room in, at the hotel, drunkenly reading me every scene of Pulp Fiction. And he'd had it, because he writes things, he hand writes everything, you know. I don't know if he still does, but he used to then. And so he just, he's go, oh, wait a minute, this is a good bit. And just, 
champagne. And, we were, and he just did the whole movie, pretty much the whole movie. Brilliant, to say the least. It was the best writing I'd seen uh, maybe ever, you know, as far as like a depth, style, and, and verbiage. I mean, it was just amazing. Uh, but I had problems with it. You know, I, I didn't know what his vision was of this, and I didn't know what to do with blowing up a guy, head off, blowing a guy's head off and having it land on you in a Christmas tree fashion. And how do I play that? You know, how do I do that? You know, how do I shoot up heroin and when I'm, I'm such a, by nature, anti, not anti, but just, I don't support drug usage, you know, so how do you play this? And, and I, there's so many questions that I thought I've got to have answered. So I had a meeting with him and he exposed his vision. And it was such a high level of a, a vision uh, that I started to see, okay, we're, we're playing ball here with, with someone who has um, almost an altruistic perspective on this whole thing. And this is not a violence for violence sake or gratuitous uh, movie, that this is actually a man with a plan. Quentin realizes that hit men don't just talk about the job. You know, I mean, I, I, I think that was the thought prior to that, that when hit men are on the way to the job, they're busy cleaning their gun, making sure, you know, you always see people checking their guns and counting their bullets, spinning the cylinders on their guns, you know, sharpening their knives or doing whatever, talking about how much they hate the person they're going to kill or why the boss wants them killed. All right, well, you can walk into a movie theater in Amsterdam and buy a beer. And I don't mean just like a little paper cup. I'm talking about a glass of beer. They got lives like everybody else. You know, you've been out of the country. Where'd you go? I went to so and so and so. Do you realize they eat, you know, French fries with mayonnaise? Ew, nasty. You know, you know what they call quarter pound with cheese in France? No, what? They call it uh, Royale with cheese. Royale with cheese. Boss wants you to take his wife out. You know how dangerous that woman is. You know, she got so and so jacked up. How? Well. Gave her a foot massage, boss threw him off. Of, oh, why would he do that? You, know, uh, uh, you ever massage the guy's feet? You, no, I have not massaged another guy's feet. It's, it's just normal kind of banter. Have you ever given a foot massage? <laughs> Don't be telling me about foot massages. I'm the foot fucking master. You giving a lot of them? Shit, yeah. Got my technique down and everything. I don't be tickling or nothing. Would you give a guy a foot massage? Fuck you. <laughs> It was such a new way of working in a lot of ways for me. I really love how Quentin had this rehearsal period. A lot of uh, directors don't have that time. We were there and we were talking about it and we were formulating and getting to know each other and, and that's when John and I became really good friends and uh, everything started to come together and we knew that it was something kind of special and just kind of, you know, the whole thing was just kind of that way. We did the whole sequence. We did the, you know, going in and out of the kitchen and, uh, you know, and the actual um, how we would go about the rubbery itself and, and the, you know, the getting up, which is a sort of iconic image of those two, you know, the um, sort of every, everybody be cool, this is a rubbery moment, is, um, I think, was, was established in rehearsal. It was something that he wanted, he saw. So a lot of things, I think he's, while he's watching the rehearsals, he's picking his shots. Um, as well, so it, it, it saved a lot of time. Normally, I, I, it feels forced and a little bit embarrassing to me rehearsing for film, but never with him. Uh, it, it always seems right with him. I remember saying, Quentin, can we try this? Yeah, yeah, try it, try anything, let's try it. And our DP, Andre Sekula, was there at the rehearsals, which is uh, very rare and so helpful. Because we didn't have that much money to make the film, really. It was uh, fairly low budget for its time, and, and it was massive. It was a massive undertaking. By 10 days, uh, all day long, he said, you know, we're ready to shoot this. We don't, more rehearsal's gonna hurt us. Let's, let's just not rehearse anymore, and let's just shoot it. When it came to shooting, we're like, <laughs> ready to rock. We knew exactly what we were doing. We had worked out any issues, and that was, that was great. A lot of directors don't do that, and I, I found that to be freeing and a great experience. Before we started shooting, uh, Quentin took us all out to this Japanese restaurant in downtown L.A. And it was one of those five-hour dinners where it's the smartest thing I think a director can do because we, we bonded. We, we, had, uh, we had a really wonderful 
time together and got to know each other, and he got to see us in, in a social situation. What the hell was that? We tried it a million different ways on that set. Have you lost your fucking mind? I think we even might have lived on that set for a couple days. Lance! Quentin asked us to just bicker, to just go at each other. What the fuck's going on out here? And Quentin would, you could, <laughs> I remember hearing him laugh while we were shooting. You know, I remember hearing him, sometimes he would just grab the camera and film it. Go to the fridge and get the thing with the adrenaline shot. The camera never stops. It's almost like the camera is the way he thinks in his head, you know, it's constantly moving and, um, and seeing what he's seeing. She's all dead! Get her the hell out of here! Get, get her the shot! shot! Fuck you! Fuck you two! Whenever you do a group scene where you're really depending on each other's timing and you're depending on each other's interpretation and you don't want to mess with each other's chi as far as your choices and their choices and how you're going to do this and you have to synchronize. It has to be harmonious to, to a degree that if you're not, it, it, the scene doesn't work. Get the shot! I am if you let me. I so fucking stop with you. Stop talking to me. Start talking Get to her. Get shot! Right! Uh, a lot of it is one take. You're taking us from one room into another and when I'm looking for that little black bag. Hurry up, Lance, we're losing her. Little fucking black bag. If there was a, a moment, Quentin would say, just say something, say something, or throw something. Pig. About midnight, we had been at it for a few hours and maybe it was even later, maybe 2 a.m. It just all started to come together and I thought, okay, this is gonna work now. We really have this down, and I see what the scene could be. Here, I'll tell you what to do. No, 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 man, man, man. I ain't give, you, you, you're gonna give it a shot. No, you're gonna give it a shot. I ain't giving her a shot. I ain't giving her the shot. I never done this yeah, before. I ain't never done it before either, all right? I ain't starting now. Look, you brought her here, and that means that you're gonna give her the shot. The day that I bring an OD and bitch to your house, then I give her the shot. Give her the shot. Give it to me. Here. Give me that. I'm always surprised when I work with movie stars, because they're never their persona. They're always much more interesting. You gotta be kneeled down in a stabbing motion. I, I, gotta, I, I gotta stab her three times. No, you I, I had a great time working with Mr. Travolta. I remember him just being goofy. All right, count to three. Just right, silly three, fun. One. Just like a child, which I loved. Two. John Travolta is, uh, there are many rooms in that mansion. I think Jody, part of her piercing and part of her, you know, that was like the ultimate needle. Three! You know, like, yeah. <laughs> you know. How often do you get to do scenes that are this well written, designed? I mean, you just don't get a chance to do that. So that's the blast. Yeah. That Jackrabbit Slim scene, you know, from the time I pick her up until I take her home, has to be one of my favorite sections of film ever, whether I'm in it or not. <laughs> It's a set piece that is just delicious. I just remember Uma being luminous. I also have a thing for the role she played, though. I gotta say, me is my favorite character. I said, God damn, God damn. She has so many different layers that I continue to think about after the story's over. I'm fascinated by all the women in Pulp Fiction. Quentin writes women really well. So do you think there's something to say? Actually, I did. I was so comfortable being there with her that I couldn't make a false note in her presence. Here it goes. Uh, what did you uh, think about what happened to Antoine? Who's Antoine? Tony Rocky Horror. You know him. Fell out of a window. I mean, mm. I don't even mm. think of myself as me in there. I just think of Vincent Vega being Vincent Vega, and I watch it as an audience. Another way would be was he was thrown out by Marcellus. And yet even another way is to say he was thrown out of a window by Marcellus because of you. Quentin calls it a zone. You know, he says, you're in the zone. Now let's meet our first contestants here this evening. Well, he let me help him with that, actually. He said, you know, I just want you to see this Godard movie where these people are doing this, uh, the twist and they're doing it in a certain fashion and I kind of want to capture that fashion. And I said, you know, that's very cool. I said, but you know, I grew up with a twist and I said, there's a lot of other fun dances that you could also include if you wanted to. He said, well, like what? I said, well, there was the Batman. There was the, the hitchhiker. I said, there's the swing. They had a high five phone, oh boy, did they let it blast? He said at the end of the day of that shoot, he said, do you realize from 7 a.m. 
until 8 p.m. in the evening for 13 hours. You have completely captivated us. He said, there is not one take where we just didn't have our mouths open with fascination. For 13 hours, take after take, he said, I am so proud of you. He said, I don't even know what to do. We should have shotguns with this kind of deal. Quentin was going for, well, black exploitation, big Afro look. And <laughs> he sent a PA to a wig store. She was supposed to get an Afro wig, and she came back with the Jerry Curl wig. And Quentin was going, no, 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 take it back, take it back. And I was like, no, wait. You know, NWA, Ice Cube, all those guys had Jerry Curls, the drippy Jerry Curls in. He was like, well, what are you something? That's the look of, you know, the gangs and, you know, all those guys who are over there, you know, banging. That's the look. And he's like, put it on. I put it on. We shined it up a bit, and it was kind of like, okay, this is who he is. You know, and Jules kind of messed with his hair. What was great with Sam was is that Sam had a much more specific take on his verbiage than I did on mine. Mine was filled with... Uh, cool and laid back. So I could go almost any direction with my dialogue. He was a was much more of a preacher in his so he could be this preacher guy and I could just reflect off of it. So if I wanted to do unusual line readings, which is what I did through most of our scenes with him, you know, uh, you know, pork chop is good. I mean, uh, uh, it, I could go, I could I could have musicality with it without it affecting anything because he was so stable in his delivery. Pigs are filthy animals. I don't eat filthy animals. Yeah, but bacon tastes good. Pork chops taste good. Hey, sewer rat may taste like pumpkin pie, but I'd never know because I wouldn't eat the filthy motherfuckers. Well, Vincent Spaces. <laughs> you know, Vincent kind of, you know, I mean, Jules is a taskmaster. He's focused, he's disciplined. You know, he's a consummate professional. You know, he's there to do the job. We'll do the other stuff after we do the job. But first we do the job. It's, it's very, very Ordell, actually. I mean, Ordell is very much the same way. You know, when you hear him talk, he said, well, I get high after. I get high when I get off work. I don't get high all day. I don't have all day to get high like you guys. You know when you go on like this, what you sound like? You sound like a sensible fucking man. That's what like I sound like. Duck. We filmed the whole scene that bookends the film all at once, you know. And it was an extraordinary experience to be on the same set with that crew. Yeah, no more liquor stores. Besides, it ain't the giggle it used to be. It's too many foreigners on liquor stores. Tim, gosh, he was good in that. Brilliant actor, brilliant human being. A lot of people come to restaurants. A lot of walnuts. Pretty smart, huh? Pretty smart. Yeah. Get all mushy behind my eyes thinking about it. I love you. I love you, honey bunny. Well, I'd already worked with her. I knew how she's she's very uh, has a very kind of natural feel about her, quite an eccentric feel about her, and I, it always was appealing to me. And so when we did the scenes together, it was it was just a, more of the same. Well, I'm not going to kill anybody. Amanda Plummer's so dear and sweet and articulate and kind of smart, and Tim has a, almost an aristocratic essence on top of his casual British street style. Garçon, coffee. Those things you don't expect what they're going to do, and that's what sends the movie off out the top, right? Right. I mean, I I had, my, I had trouble not laughing because it's just it, the, the idea of that coming out of her mouth is just. Uh, it's crazy. Brilliant, brilliant bit of casting. It's like a kid celebrating sort of her lover, but the way she celebrates it is through violence and, uh, and mayhem. It was great too because the extras, extras had no idea what was going on there. So the whole time we were shooting that thing and they were jumping all over the place, robbing people and, you know, talking. By the time they got to John and I over in that corner, the people in there actually thought we were undercover cops. <laughs> they had no idea. They were going, good thing these cops are here. These guys, are like, what do you think they're doing here? I was like, the cops are having lunch, but they're undercover. So it was like really cool that they did that. Are you going to give me a problem? No, sir, I'm not. I'm not going to give me a fucking problem. problem. It was the first scene to shoot on Pulp Fiction, so John was brand, you know, it was brand new for him. He was playing around with character. Sam was playing around with character, as were you know, a man of himself. So we were just laughing our asses off because we knew we had something fun and special, and it was playtime for the boys and the girls. 
it was it felt like a little fresh theatre company doing this odd little separate film in the middle of nowhere. It was it was a lot of fun. I was sad when it was over. I think we showed it in about a week. What the fuck are you doing? You fucking yuppie, get down! Oh, and I think I got to knock Lawrence Bender to the ground and call him yuppie scum, which um, was kind of fun. <laughs> What's in the case? My boss's dirty laundry. Your boss makes you do his laundry? When he wants it clean. Sounds like a shit job. Funny, I was thinking the same thing. Open it. Afraid I can't do that. The only regret I had is in the original script, I shot him. I would shoot him, and then I'd shoot her off the countertop. And then I would open my eyes, and you'd realize it was still there. Because that's what Jules would have done before the revelation in the apartment. And Quentin said, no, I'm not going to shoot it. I'm not going to shoot it. And he wouldn't shoot it because he said if he shot it, he would keep it. And I'm like, that's part of the beauty of what's going on here. And I, I still regret to this day that we never actually, you know, shot that because I still think it would have been something good on the outtakes. And Tarantino was amazing to work with. His verbal direction made such sense with me that it didn't go through my ears and went straight through my skin. How we doing, baby? I, I gotta go pee. I'm gonna go home. Directors like that, you, you, you jump off a cliff for, if they ask you. I love you. I love you too, honey bunny. I would like to see a film of where they are now. I've always thought it'd be kind of fun to revisit those characters and I'd love to see more of them. They were great characters to play, very funny, very sweet, actually. I loved them. Give me a pack of red apples. Build this. The Bruce choice I loved because I felt like we were bookends in this movie. You looking at something, friend? He ain't my friend, Palooka. What's that? I think you heard me just fine, Punchy. I liked how it played on many levels, you know? I'm kind of the guy that the audience is voting for from an underdog position, and he's the winner fighter. And, like, who do you vote for now, you know? Who are you going to go with? That balance of two people knowing that they're in different ways dangerous to each other was spectacular. This isn't the last time you're gonna see these two guys. You know that from the way it's set up. You go, how is this gonna interconnect? And it and it and it did. God damn it. I said don't do that. Hey, you know fuck you're fucking freaking out on us. In the script, when John and I are in the car, when he turns around to ask the kid in the back seat, do you think it was God? And his gun goes off, he actually shoots him in the throat. In the original script. And he's sitting in the back seat like, <coughs> like what the fuck did you do? Oh my god, this, no, we gotta stop the car, we gotta have some help. And then John shoots him in the head. Why the fuck didn't you tell us somebody was in the bathroom? I always said he did it on purpose because he was pissed off because he never told us about the guy in the bathroom. Quentin never confirmed or denied that. <laughs> John still insisted it was an accident being the guy that he is, but Vincent, Vincent's just that kind of person. Marvin, what do you make of all this? Man, I don't even have an opinion. In that scene, I improvised. It was, I shot Marvin, was the written word. What I asked permission to say is, could I just say I shot Marvin in the face? And I knew the way I would say it would have humor because I would say it in a way as I, as I stepped up, like I stepped on his toes or I, I you know, knocked into him or something. Oh, what the fuck's happening? Oh, oh shit, man. man. Oh, man, I shot Marvin in the face. Why the fuck did you do that? Well, I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. I blew his head off, but I shot him in the face as like I tried to make less of what I did. And it worked. If Jimmy's ass ain't home, I don't know what the fuck we gonna do, man, because I ain't got no other partners in 818. Quentin, he even said to me when the movie was done, I didn't know I was making a comedy. He said, <laughs> and, and I said, I'm sorry, it's just the only way I could get through it. I want to ask you a question. When you came pulling in here, did you notice a sign on the front of my house that said Dead Nigger Storage? I love to watch Quentin as a director and as an actor. I, th I think he is a, who could be more of an original guy than Quentin? You know why you didn't see that sign? Because it ain't there, because storing dead niggers ain't my fucking business. That's why. He's got a real unique sense of self that comes through in what he does, and he's fascinating to watch. His interpretation, I can't even imagine anyone else but Quentin in that role. Jimmy, we're not going to store it. Don't you fucking realize, man, that if Bonnie comes home 
and finds a dead body in her house, I'm gonna get divorced. All right, no marriage counseling, no trial separation. I'm gonna get fucking divorced, okay? And I don't wanna get fucking divorced. His acceptance of bizarre irony, you know, what happens if his wife comes home and finds this headless person, but with no real, like, shock that this is out of the realm of anyone's acceptance, he brought reality and light to the darkest imaginations of, of an audience. You got to appreciate what an explosive element this Bonnie situation is. We actually added other stuff. I mean, that whole thing with us in uh, Jimmy's house and his wife coming in was something we added just because we were standing there talking about it. We said, well, we ought to do it. And it's like, okay. It's like, well, why couldn't we kill these people in the diner? It didn't feel like work, you know? And a lot of films do feel like quite monotonous work, to be honest with you, but never with him. You know, mostly what you feel is that the days are running out. Every time you did a scene, it was gone. With Quentin, it's like you hit the ground running and then suddenly it's over and you feel bad that it's done. You know? It was so much fun. It's exactly what you wish your work experience could be like every time. When I went to Cannes, that movie exploded right in front of our eyes on the biggest screen I'd ever seen in my life. Just like a tidal wave came over us. And there was one moment my wife put her hand on my hand. She said, oh, honey, oh, honey. She just couldn't get over how brilliant it was, you know. And uh, I think it was the moment where I was shuffling through Jack Rabbit Slims and I had watched some guy go by and it was just done kind of very slight slow motion and stuff and it was just when it just culminated for her that this was a piece of genius happening here you know and uh i took the ride with the audience that night and my dad who was 83 he was floored by it captivated by it thought it was the best thing he'd ever seen when they announced you know the palm door and quentin wins uh you know, people are like, ah, oh, they're, they're standing ovation again, standing ovation again. And then by the time everybody quiets down, somebody in the, in the top yells something about, it's a piece of shit! And he goes, oh, fuck you! <laughs> and we uh, go back to the hotel. And Bruce came in, went to his room, got his boom box, plugged it in downstairs, paid the bartender some money to keep the bar open all night, and we just turned the lobby of that hotel into a disco. It was great. <laughs> Once we won the Palm Door, the word was out throughout the world that, uh-oh, watch this movie. Then we got booked in the New York Film Festival. We were all up there in the balcony. And I, I hadn't seen it yet. And I don't think many people had. I can't speak for them, though. And so it was, it was gorgeous, a gorgeous ride. When it got to the, the sh adrenaline shot scene, somebody started screaming in the audience and they, they stopped the film and brought up the lights and somebody was having a heart attack. It was the stabbing in the heart of the needle, then bam, the moans and groans. The woman saying, stop the movie and I swear to you, the, the, the voice of the woman sounded exactly like my sister, Margaret. And so I said, oh my God, my father has had a heart attack right after the scene of Uma getting at the heart. And I can't believe this. I'm gonna lose my father in the middle of this movie at, at this big night. And that's when, um, you know, the real legends of Pulp Fiction star is like, this woman has a heart attack in the audience when Uma Thurman gets stabbed in the chest with the adrenaline needle. It's like, she had, um, what, um, um, well, she was diabetic. She, had, she went into anaphylactic shock or some shit and needed some, needed some candy. <laughs> but, you know, it was like one of those things that people go, oh, I gotta see this movie. Oh my God, because... It was a big, you know, it was a big deal that somebody passed out in the middle of the movie, in the middle of that needle scene. If Saturday Night Fever was the movie of the 70s, of course, Pulp Fiction was the, the movie of the 90s. But it's so much more than that. It, 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 it changed filmmaking forever. What immediately happened, and, and, in a, in a, and, in, and in a good way, 
Um, it inspired a bunch of directors to go out and make films. He actually created, you know, not to mention the whole, you know, time frame and the way you put a film together or the way a film can work. Because I, mean, I remember my mom saying, why didn't they put the movie together right? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She said, it was jumping all over the place, back and forth. You were dead, you were alive, and you are back, you're here. I'm like, man, that's how the movie works. It's just a convention. It's like, everybody can't watch it. Apparently you can. It's okay. But, um, yeah, it, uh, it uh, created a whole new school of people um, that made it okay to just do a film the way you want to do it. You know, so what do people think is dyslexia? People come up to me, it's one of their favorite favorites, Pulp Fiction. Absolutely. All over the world. It's, they love it. You see, that's the thing with Quentin. He doesn't do things arbitrarily. It has real thought, depth, and, and decision to him. And, and he sits with it for a long period. It's not like uh, fleeting or capricious decisions. These are well thought out decisions. You know, I was a 20 year decision. And then the gift he gave me and giving me my career back at a high level. I mean, the best directors ask me to do their movies and I get offered the best scripts and I'm still riding off of it. Uh, but that's all because of his, you know, giving me my, my, my life back as an artist. There's a lot of people who, you know, are one hit wonder directors and then disappear, but he just keeps growing, changing, exploring. I, I'm looking forward to seeing the next 20 years. His personality is, within his films, which is what makes him so compelling to me. He's one of the two or three filmmakers that I will go and see everything he does, as soon as I can. Yeah, I love him. I love him. I love his big heart. And he opens up different doors of perception, which I think is a great gift to give to people. He's always been a great filmmaker, even in his head. When he was sitting in that video store watching movies, he was becoming a really great filmmaker. Uh, and I think that's what makes him a great filmmaker because he loves film. He loves storytelling. Um, there aren't a lot of people who do this job who have the kind of uh, genuine adoration for what the cinema is or what cinematic history is or what made us fall in love with movies in the first place. And he's one of those people uh, that gives his soul to those particular things when he goes to work. And that's the biggest thing about him that I appreciate.